Welcome to the wild, wild east, to which we might add, here come the judges. Immediately, as with any ancient texts, we are faced with a multitude of issues. Specifically, we might ask, were the days of Israel's judges spun by later biblical writers and editors, who themselves were in the employ of and apologists for the Israelite monarchy? Bear in mind, prior to the monarchy, under King David, King Solomon, and a host of others, Israel was basically what we might call a tribal confederacy, a loose alliance of tribes, each pursuing their own interests, with no central authority. Meaning, they had trouble uniting when the need arose, but no monarch to oppress them. No monarchy? That sounded pretty good to America's revolutionary generation, who hated the British crown and held as an ideal a loose confederation, not of tribes, but of states, which would become the United States. The great revolutionary writer and orator Thomas Paine observed this about ancient Israel. Near 3,000 years passed away from the Mosaic account of the creation till the Jews under a national delusion requested a king. Till then, their government, except in extraordinary cases where the Almighty interposed, was a kind of republic administered by a judge and the elders of the tribes. Kings they had none, and it was held sinful to acknowledge any being under that title but the Lord of hosts. And when a man seriously reflects on the idolatrous homage which is paid to the persons of kings, he need not wonder that the Almighty, ever jealous of his honor, should disapprove of a form of government which so impiously invades the prerogative of heaven. How ironic that the Bible should paint the days of the judges on such a dark canvas, when the founders of our own republic saw that same period from around 1200 to 1000 BCE as the good old days. Even George Washington voiced principles that were pretty consistent with the days of the judges. Avoid foreign entanglements, have no standing army, raise militias when needed, and avoid the heavy burden of taxation. Yet the book of Judges concludes saying, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did the right in his own eyes. And I ask, is this truth or spin? Of course, our knowledge of the days of the judges is rather limited. It isn't known precisely which laws were in practice under the Israelite Tribal League. We read that Joshua set a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Some think that might be the so-called Covenant Code of Exodus 21, 1 through 22. On such things, we can only speculate. The one thing that does seem clear is that for 200 years, the Israelites rejected the idea of a central state. In crisis, a leader, a judge or shofet would arise, inspired by the divine spirit and leading the people into battle. Being by no means a king, his authority rested on personal qualities, sheer charisma. Bear in mind, the judges did dispense justice. They could be tribal leaders or people whose wisdom was highly regarded or leaders who had shown great courage on the battlefield. 
It was certainly a time of testing for the tribal confederacy. It was said, they did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal and Asherot. And that assessment is probably right. No single judge managed to pull all the tribes together. The question was, how many chieftains could you persuade to call out their troops? Around 1200 BCE, a king from the Euphrates region named Kushan Rishatayim engaged and was beaten back by the Egyptians. He sought consolation by pillaging Israel on his retreat. A judge rose up, Otniel, son of Kenaz, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. He rallied the tribal army, and the king rushed home. Then, in the early 12th century BCE, the Moabites conquered the tribe of Reuven, then crossed the Jordan and captured Jericho. They turned Benjamin into a vassal tribe at the head of a delegation of Benjamites who came to Jericho to present an annual tribute to King Eglon of Moab was one Ehud, son of Gerah, probably a member of an important family. He wears a double-edged dagger concealed on his right side. He asks to have a private word with the king. Eglon is a fat man and Ehud thrusts his dagger deep in his belly. The shaft goes in after the blade, preventing immediate external bleeding that might be discovered too soon. The attendants think King Eglon is asleep and retreat quietly. Ehud heads for the hills of Ephraim and blows a shofar. <laughs> and the children of Israel went down with him. The leaderless Moabites retreat across the Jordan. The weapon, a dagger, a symbol, literarily of liberation. Next we read, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anat, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad and he also delivered Israel. We assume, as backstory, that these were the mercenary Philistine occupational forces stationed at the city of Bet Sha'an by Egyptian occupiers. The weapon, an ox goad, another literary symbol of liberation. Around 1140 BCE, a coalition of Canaanite kings headed by King Yabin of Hatzor, determined to put an end to the central and northern Israelite tribes. They assembled a large army of 900 chariots in the Jezreel Valley. The Israelite tribal militia took up position in the hilly terrain near the rim of the valley, headed by the Israelite commander, Barak, and the great female judge, Deborah. The Canaanite general, Sisra, gathered the Canaanite chariots at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo and proceeded to Mount Tabor. The Canaanites were confident in the surprise element and in their chariots lacking to Israel. Yabin had an advantage in manpower and weaponry but his chariots couldn't negotiate Mount Tabor and the hills of Galilee, and the initiative remained with Barak. Israel attacked on a rainy day. The valley turned to mud, and the chariots became mired and stuck. The Kishon River flooded, preventing escape. Deborah's great poetic song reads, the Wadi Kishon swept them away, that ancient wadi, the wadi Kishon. It's a classic of ancient Hebrew poetry. The defeat 
of the Canaanite chariots turned into the mother of all retreats. The Canaanites' iron chariots were useless, and the children of Israel turned tactical superiority into triumph. Sisra himself abandoned his chariot, which was stuck in the mire, fleeing on foot through the hills of Lower Galilee toward the Jordan Valley. He was killed in the tent of Yael, wife of Heber the Kenite, likely a priestess, revered by both Canaanites and Israelites. Sisra had sought refuge in her sanctuary, but she was stirred by a command from God and drove a tent peg through his skull. There was never again a serious threat to the tribes of Israel. The weapon? Rain, another literary symbol of liberation. We don't know Deborah's tribe. More important is her portrayal as a spiritual and military leader. But Deborah was not the only Israelite woman to hold a place of power. So let's raise an issue. How unusual was it for a woman to lead? It was rare, but not unprecedented in the ancient world. Women were especially esteemed in Egypt, but not in Canaan. So we just might look at Israel during the period of the judges as progressive. Do you suppose Israel became more hierarchical and, yes, more sexist as the tribal confederacy later became a full-fledged monarchy? A new threat later presented itself. Nomadic marauders from the desert, Amalekites, Midianites, and Bnei Kedem, acting as their own tribal confederacy. They used camels, which terrified the sedentary Israelites. An unlikely judge arose, Gideon, son of Joash, of the tribe of Manasseh. He leads a carefully picked force of 300 tribesmen. He climbs the hills at night by torchlight. He orders his men to conceal their torches within pitchers. They advance from three sides, blowing their horns and breaking the pitchers. They shout, the sword for the Lord and for Gideon. The marauders flee in panic, trapped by the Israelite force. The weapons, shofars, torches, and pitchers, all symbols of liberation. The children of Israel being oppressed by the Midianites, Gideon marched against them with a small army, and victory through the divine interposition decided in his favor. The Jews, elate with success and attributing it to the generalship of Gideon, proposed making him a king. Rule thou over us, thou and thy son, and thy son's son. Here was temptation in its fullest extent. Not a kingdom only, but an hereditary one. But Gideon, in the piety of his soul, replied, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Words need not be more explicit. Gideon doth not decline the honor, but denieth their right to give it. Neither doth he compliment them with invented declarations of his thanks, but in the positive style of a prophet charges them with disaffection to their proper sovereign, the king of heaven. But one of Gideon's sons, Avimelech or Abimelech, later makes himself king over Shechem. The people rebel and he burns the city in battle, only to be killed in battle for another city. The weapon? A stone tossed down by a woman on the wall another symbol of liberation. We're told the land was not yet ready for a king. 
as if things are better with a monarchy? Is this more biblical spin? The next threat, the Ammonites desire lands once captured by Moses and gather an army. The people appeal to Yiftah or Jephthah for help. Jephthah is the son of a harlot whose half-brother threw him out so that he wouldn't share in their inheritance. He roams about and becomes a brigand, perhaps one of the Habiru. But now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Yiftah, Jephthah. He vows that if he succeeds in his battle against the Ammonites, he'll offer as a burnt offering whatever comes forth from the doors of my house to meet me. Jephthah wins, returns, and his daughter came out to meet him with timbrel and with dances, and she was his only child. He did with her according to the vow which he had vowed. No further details are given. The weapon, a vow, a symbol of liberation, but also of folly. When the Torah says, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain, the reference is exactly to this sort of thing, making rash vows to Israel's deity. Next, a powerful man from the tribe of Dan rises to slay Philistines, Samson. The struggle with the Philistines is the background for the Samson stories. The Philistines came to the land in the 12th century before the Common Era, several generations after the arrival of Israel. They settled along the southern coast around three main cities, Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ashdod. They had two more centers inland, Gat and Ekron. At the start of the 11th century, the five cities organized into a confederation. They probably brought with them the art of ironworking, preserving a monopoly in this trade right until the days of King Saul. In the days of Samson, the Philistines had already gotten the upper hand, ruling various parts of Judah. As a young man, Samson, known for his Herculean strength, falls in love with a Philistine girl from Timnah. He asks his parents to arrange a marriage. They oppose, but he persists. One day, Samson meets a lion. He wrestles and strangles the lion with his hands. Later, on another visit to Timnah, he sees that the carcass has become infested with beehives. During the wedding feast, he promises fine linen clothing to his companions if they can solve a riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong, something sweet. They get his wife to coax it out of him and return to Samson saying, what's stronger than a lion? What's sweeter than honey? Samson in anger, slays many Philistines, giving their clothing to his companions. The weapon, the jawbone of a donkey, a symbol of liberation. Samson also went to a harlot named Delilah, Delilah, who is bribed to find the source of his strength. He tells her several lies, for example, that if he's bound with seven vines, he'll become weak. The Philistines try this, it doesn't work. She coaxes him again, and he finally says that if his hair is cut, he will lose his strength. So she cuts off his hair, and he's captured, blinded, and brought to the Philistine temple during a festival. Samson prays one last time, gets his strength back, and tears down the central columns, bringing down the whole temple and killing all. Next, a bloody internecine war breaks out among the tribes. The cause? Benjamin won't surrender one of its members who had molested and murdered 
the concubine of another tribesman. The bereaved man cuts up her corpse, sends pieces to the tribes throughout the land. In a cry for justice, war is declared on Benjamin. Benjamin is successful at first, but almost wiped out in the end. There were no judges in this civil war. The weapons used were against each other. There was no liberation. The total number of judges, 12, one for each tribe. But here's the issue. As the biblical narrative continues into the books of Samuel, the tribe of Benjamin appears strong and healthy when they had just been almost annihilated. How odd. Uh, could it be that the whole incident occurred earlier, perhaps toward the beginning of the period of the judges, only to be transposed to the end as part of the larger spin, and that this was a chaotic age in which everyone did the right in his own eyes because there was no king in Israel. Amid all these tales, a distinctive history emerges. After a period of piety and tranquility, Israel begins to follow false gods. The deity punishes them by sending foreign warriors to oppress them. When Israel repents, God sends a hero, a shofet, to the rescue. The oppressor is overthrown, peace restored. Then the cycle of apostasy, oppression, repentance, and deliverance repeats itself. Underlying all this is a picture of the uncertainties of life in Canaan during the 12th and 11th centuries. The League of Twelve Tribes survived nearly 200 years with no move to create a unified state. Monarchy, prevalent in Canaan, was anathema to Israel, at least for the time being. Thomas Paine said it best. The nearer any government approaches to a republic, the less business there is for a king. Of more worth is one honest man to society and in the sight of God than all the crowned ruffians that ever lived. But all of that was, of course, soon to change. <laughs>